Hello, welcome back. Um, so here I am again with another session. Um, first of all, uh, thank you very much for for the feedback. Um, so I hope this time the font um, in the editor is larger, so you can read the font. Um, let's see if I'm doing a better job mixing the audio. So there's still some background music, I hope. Um, and my voice should be first, you know, foreground and it shouldn't be to distract into how the music, but at the same time, we don't have complete silence um, because I think that would be boring. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for the feedback. Uh, then uh, the next thing I'm going to say today is that, well, the streaming failed completely. Um, so I thought that I had checked everything, uh, that I had looked at the software and everything that was required to do the streaming, but I kind of forgot one tiny detail that is actually quite important. That is basically my internet connection, which is not very good. So um, I don't have enough uh, upload to actually do proper streaming. So that was a total fail. And um, that means that this is not live streaming. I, I can't do live streaming at the moment. Um, I'm not sure if um, my internet connection at home will change anytime soon. So for now, what I'm going to do is, or at least that's what I plan to do as part of this experiment, is to uh, record the sessions uh, like it, it was live cutting, uh, right? Um, I'm not going to do any editing unless, you know, I have to go for whatever reason and I have to post everything and, you know, there's a long time, you know, we'll do some cutting over there, but um, in essence, I don't plan to do any editing, so it will be like it was live. Um, the only downside of this is that there is no real uh, real-time uh, interaction, although, to be honest, uh, I was not completely sure about that because if I'm programming, I'm not looking at the chat and obviously you need a good internet connection so there is no delay and it kind of makes sense that you can have that communication otherwise it's not really ideal um, uh, because of the delay um, so well you know other than that it should be the same um, you're more than welcome to leave comments on YouTube uh, or you know mention anything you want to talk about on, in tweet, on Twitter or by email or whatever uh, that's fine. Um, uh, so other than that, it should be pretty much the same. Um, I have updated the FAQ. Um, so and I know for now, let's assume that I'm going to keep that up uh, up to date. So you know, there's a URL somewhere here, uh, so you can read that and basically you know go there and see what is this about. Um, so today, uh, actually, this is interesting. I forgot again. <laughs> well, okay. Set as patron, bad buffer, content cycles. That's what, what I'm going to do today, more or less. Um, um, so yeah, so that's another thing I had. A couple of sessions of research uh, that basically, um, you know, I was trained the idea of the back buffer, the idea that I commented or mentioned in the previous session. And um, I think that session was not, I mean, it was two sessions. Uh, I don't think they were very interesting, uh, although maybe, I mean, that's priming, right? So I'm not completely sure. I had the feeling that it was not interesting, but it could be. The problem with research, you know, when I'm trying some new ideas is, you know, very often I don't know what I'm doing. So it is very possible that after the session I don't get anywhere or that like it happened in this case, I'm making a very stupid mistake and I don't realize because it was late, I was tired and until next day. Um, so that could be a little bit boring, especially if I'm not going to do any editing. Um, but I'm not sure. I mean, I might do a little bit of that in the future, but it has to be simple. Obviously not the, the, the type of stuff I was trying uh, the other day. Um, 
And uh, yeah, that's pretty much uh, my plan. So just do regular sessions like I was priming normally. I will explain a little bit what I'm doing. Um, and um, there is a chance that I might do stuff that is not recorded. So, but that's probably okay, isn't it? Um, so going back to the previous session, uh, we're talking about uh, the bug buffer um, uh, where I was mentioning, so let's take a look at the game. So let's start the game. And yeah, okay, so this is my current set of spectrum project. Um, and well, this is not actually the same version I, I, I was showing in the previous session. This has some improvements. Uh, I will talk about them in a minute. So as you can see here in this line, actually, because um, I'm, I'm trying to synchronize and update the game state every 16 frames. Uh, so, you know, there is some, there are some glitches here because I need more than one frame to draw the area. So, um, I always going to have some tearing and some glitches over there. Um, so I was trying to reduce that, um, with a bug buffer, but then I realized that this area here is quite large. So at the end, um, there was not really a lot of benefit without using a huge amount of memory. So I tried the first prototype without going with the fastest way you can do it, which is using the stack to copy memory. But I, I found that it was a little bit annoying to program and um, yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, probably I, I, there must be a different way of doing it. And this approach is definitely not it. But it's not too bad, and I can tell you, you play this on a real machine with a CRT uh, TV, for example, you, you know, that's quite forgiving. You're not going to see that glitch as much as you can see here, although this is an improved version. Um, and what I'm seeing is an improved version. Um, let's see what is improved here. Well, um, so let's take a look to the to the actual code here, which is, so yeah, so I have a lot of functions here from, from a library that I'm probably going to release open source at some point. Um, they all start with the prefix ZX. Um, and then, you know, that you could be using those for any any type of game. Probably, if you ask me, not this type of game. I don't know why I'm trying doing scroll. I think that's a recurrent problem when I try to make a game. So th this this library and the functions I'm making, they work very well, you know, it's great, but they are not specifically uh, uh, designed for this type of, of, of problem because when you're doing a scroll, you have to update this complete screen uh, every frame uh, that you draw. And this, the functions and the way I'm, I'm working here is more oriented to use less memory and instead only draw the changes between frames. So basically I have a buffer, but instead of being the complete, uh, you know, exactly the same amount of memory you have in the video memory, um, what I'm doing is just keeping track of, uh, you know, what is the, the tile that I need to put. I mean, a tile is what I call, uh, eight per eight uh, character. So eight per eight is one character, which is eight per eight pixels. So I track for each uh, character in the screen or eight per eight tile. I try what is the tile I want to draw and the attribute, which is, can, is going to be uh, a value for paper and another one for ink. So, because you can have two attributes per eight per eight cell in the spec key. So basically I track that, which is not the same as keeping the actual bitmap and the attributes. So I use way less memory. So home, home, what is the memory I'm using at the moment? Uh, let me see, I think I have the buffer definition. Yeah, so, which is, you know, it's quite small. It's less than, you know, 2.3K, which is quite small compared with the whole screen that is about 16K. So. You know, this is designed to 
be used when you are short of memory, for example, 48K uh, projects like this one initially. Uh, and probably I'm going to continue with 48K because I'm not going to use the double buffer. Um, so in that way, you know, I can use some properties, for example, uh, um, if we go to that, to that that I close. So here I'm imposing some limitations. Well, this is an extension from the compiler from SDCC that you can tell the compiler where do you want the linker to place this, this, uh, this array. So this chunk of memory. And I want in this address. So basically what I'm asking is, um, is that the higher bit is always going to be one. Um, so I can use that as a flag to know if that tile is, is clean. So it's on the screen of its dirty, meaning that I need to draw that on the screen. So um, that's, that's the way it works. This, this leverage works like that. So in this updated screen is small, because the game area is not the completed screen. It's just, you know, we don't redraw the frame and, you know, few things. So this is optimized to reduce the amount of, of screen that we're going to work with, right? So basically, um, after discarding the idea of working with the back buffer, I thought that there was a way, a small improvement that I could be using to um, to draw less. So basically, this is this is not we. I'm not targeting speed, so I'm not trying to do the fastest that is possible that you can. Because, for example, um, because I'm copying tile by tile, and the way the uh, spec in memory, the video memory is arranged. Uh, Basically, every time I increase um, one uh, one row in the tile, I increment just one HL, which is the source where I'm having the 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 the, the tile uh, the tile bitmap, right? Um, in the destination in video memory, I had to increase D, so that it's like you're increasing 256 every time so that kind of forced me you know there are not many options this is the fastest way you can copy that memory and this is quite slow actually uh a little bit of a spoiler let's see how 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 slow is that so let's see yeah so this is currently 200 cycles which is which is not exactly what we want to measure, actually, because this is the part where we get in the tile address. So let's be fair. Let's only do um, calculate the time of the actual copying the bitmap, which is 168. I mean, that's that's quite slow, to be honest. So I don't know. When I was running some tests with this engine, with this engine, uh, with the tiles and the, the changes, I think you can manage to get up to. 12 tiles in a frame and uh, and currently uh, currently what we're doing is is 15 per 14 mm. so I mean it's 7 because I mean this is the view but it's in the uh, the tiles in the map are 16 per 16 so this is actually 30 per 14 in real 8 per 8 tiles. So, I mean, that's definitely more than 12, isn't it? <laughs> so there's no way. Um, so I made a change here. So I'm using the highest bit to check if, you know, if it's dirty, I don't draw. So what I want to do is try to do less stuff. So if I do less things, I will go faster. Um, so in this case, what I'm doing is I changed because initially I was copying first the, the tile bitman here, and then after that I was copying the attribute. But I do it, uh, I do the opposite now. I copy first the attribute, and if the attribute tells me that is black ink, 
and black paper, that means that I didn't really care about the bitmap. So I could have any bitmap whatsoever. If the background is black and the ink is black, what you see is black, right? So that's a very nice and simple way of optimizing this. Um, and let's take a look with uh, if this works uh, with a different emulator and that is called uh, Retro Virtual Machine. Uh, that for some things is is great, is amazing, but for other things can be a little bit, yeah, because it has all this hardware acceleration, a lot of stuff going on, and it uses a little bit more resources. But anyway, let's. So let's use this great stuff here. So we can ask to see the, so this is what the ULA uh, sees from the point of view of attributes. So this is ink and this is paper. It, and you know, this is actually showing us what are the attributes. And on the second one, we're going to see what is the bitmap. So if you get the bitmap and the attributes all together, what you get is, you know, what we were looking at render, right? So let's, let's see if I can get focus. Right. So there you are. So on the, on the right screen, um, uh, it, yeah, it's working. So on the right screen, you can see what is the actual bitmap uh, in video memory. And on the left, you can see the attributes. Now, because we, we agree that, uh, you know, if it's zero and zero, we're not going to do anything. See, you can see here, there are already, uh, well, one, the equivalent one 16 by 16 tile here, uh, and, you know, a chunk here that is not being, it's not being erased. So, because we don't care. So basically what, it, what I'm doing is changing the attributes. So the attributes match, but the bitmap doesn't. And, and that's fine, because if we look at how the screen looks, so basically it's just fine. And, and you know, I'm skipping the 168 plus cycles that requires to do one of, one of those eight per eight uh, tiles. So that's great, that's saving time. And, um, and you know that's how I did it here by you know just changing a little bit the order. Now what I'm doing here, I'm not completely sure. Maybe I could optimize this a little bit because um, so one trick I do because uh, I use the highest bit, um, the highest bit uh, of the tile address to signal you know if it's zero the highest bit, then I don't draw. Um, so I'm storing the tile address, uh, changing the NDNS. So instead of being uh, little NDN, I'm using big NDN. So swapping that means that the first byte that I have is the high address, so I can check the byte. But then because the third one is the attribute, so I don't know. Maybe I should change. I should change the arrangement of of how the data is stored in the buffer, maybe. So I don't have to go back and forth. But at the end of the day, this is not a big deal because uh, the big chunk is is this part here. This part here is the big chunk. This is the biggest problem. And you know, you have to copy a lot of lines. So really reducing few cycles here and there is not going to change anything, I think. So I mean, obviously, the less time you you use, well, the better. Uh, but it's not going to make a huge improvement, or it's not going to be significant. I think. So that's the change that I finally implemented, and um, and then um, yeah, basically, um, I was looking at the at the assembler code, you know, very hard trying to find, figure out if I could improve in, I could improve this in, in any way. And then, well, I already showed you some bits, uh, you know, if we want to know how much is this, um, I can select an area, uh, a section, and then pipe the content into a tool that I created in just 
yesterday, yeah, two days ago maybe. That is set eight account, um, and it basically, you know, will tell me what are the number of cycles. Here on the left is a cycle of this instruction, and here on the right is a subtotal, so it keeps adding. So you can tell that this block is 32. Uh, in case uh, there is a, you know, a condition like this one, there is a branch, um, it will tell me the cost of uh, the condition being met and getting through the branch and, and the cost of not, on the condition is not met. So in this case, if um, the result of doing the OR of the accumulator with itself is zero, it costs you 12 cycles. And if it is not zero and you go, you continue, it's seven cycles. Um, so that tool is something I developed, um, yeah, two days ago. So let's, let's take a look to that one. So, Oh, this this tool is open source, so uh, so yeah, it's set a count. It's set a count. It's on GitHub. You know, you can go to my GitHub and take a look. I will put the link in the video notes, uh, so you can take a look if you're interested. So um, this is a so let's take a look to the readme maybe. So yeah, it, the tool requires Python three. And it's very simple. Um, it has some it has some options. Uh, so it has a command line interface. You can, you know, include the subtotal. By default, it doesn't do it. And then it's, it will try to update the existing count in available in a comment. So it it adds a comment to the source code. So it will try to update the existing uh, comment if it can find uh, the brackets and the numbers. Um, but you know, I mean, this could be extended to do more things, but I think it's probably what it does is more than enough for what, what I need. Um, and the interface is basically using a standard input and a standard, a standard output um, uh, because by default, because it's very convenient to do it like this in Beam and you can pipe and, you know, there is an example here. So, you know, I could be getting this and just doing the pipe again. And you know it, it's very simple, so it's very convenient to use inside the editor. Um, uh, now the implementation is not is not very fast because it's using regular expressions. <laughs> well, yeah, which I mean, I think I said on Twitter I was parsing set eighty assembler with regular expressions. That's not actually true. I'm not parsing it. What I'm doing is more like matching All right uh, so instead of parsing I'm matching and let's wait a second I think I lost the audio okay so well the music background for now maybe next time uh, anyway so um, so it's not, it's not it's not actually parsing uh, serity it's actually matching so basically what I have here is, um, so I got a huge table with things like this uh, in a very common syntax that is basically telling me if we load on BC a register a numeric value, then that is going to be 10 cycles. Then I generated automatically, oh, you know, with another Python script, this regular expression here. Uh, so what I'm trying to do is, <laughs> I mean, it has to be slow because by brute force, I'm trying to match all the possibilities. Well, it's basically, I go through all the possibilities until one of them uh, matches. So yeah. So I load uh, the JSON file. I mean, all this mambo jimbo here is basically because I have, you know, I want, uh, you should be able to run the, the Python script for anywhere. And it will try to find the JSON file in the same directory where the uh, Python script is. 
And, and also because I want, I mean, I'm using the real path because I have a sin limb into my Vim directory, my home directory. So yeah, I mean, forget about it. That's just to make it more easier to use. So basically, um, each re re regular expression here is being, I, I compile that, adding some extra for, you know, there could be comments on the end. So, I mean, this is not going to cover all the cases. It's not going to match all the set 80 uh, assembler out there, but it matches most of the stuff I use, which is enough for me. Uh, here I'm detecting what is the, the you know, or comment how, how, it's look, how it looks like. So I can look for that again uh, if I try to date. And then, you know, I get from the, by default it's a standard, it's a standard input and output is a standard output. Um, so basically, you know, I read lines, I don't have context. So every single line, what I do is actually, yeah, this could be optimized because I'm sorting for every line. Oh man, let's do it. So, so we got the table here. So, so let's sort the table. So in this way, yeah, I was sorting the table for every line that I read, which is probably <laughs> not the fastest way of doing it. So in this way, what I do is I sort uh, I sort the table using the W value. And that W value is actually um, quite important uh, because, um, so I'm not parsing, I'm just matching. And for example, here, this, so these two lines here, these two lines, um, work as long as I match the first one first. Uh, sorry, it should be like this, but uh, because I'm looking for GR, so relative jump and then zero flag and then some test. But this here is actually matching against something like this, which actually matched the other one, this one here. So the order has to be like this. Uh, so when I generated um, when I generated the table, what I did is uh, assign a weight base on on the be more general to more sorry more specific to more general. So I need to sort those, otherwise, you know, you might get the wrong uh, match. Um, then basically <laughs> I do a uh, uh, brute force. So I go through the table until I find a match. And when I find a match, this is just very basic. It's just adding the comment if I need to. And, and, and otherwise, you know, if there is not a match, I just output the line as it is. Um, so we made a change now. So let's take a look. Let's see if this still works. Now I don't have tests, so I should write some tests at some point, but to be honest, I don't think this is important and it's not really. So we can run it here and it looks fine to me. Um, so 212, yeah, yeah, it is still returning the same result. So we didn't break anything, although, uh, you know, it was very clear we didn't. So instead of sorting the table, I mean, probably Python is doing Probably Python is doing something behind the scenes, so I don't think this is a big difference. I don't think it's even worth uh, measuring this to see if it's actually faster or not. Um, I don't think there is a big difference, to be honest, but you know, this is better. So, so we can keep it. Um, so let's get this one and then uh, yeah, this is our change. Uh, yeah. Uh, what did I do? All uh, right, yeah. 
and you have something that is a bit on push. Anyway, so yeah, that was a small improvement. There are probably other things we can improve here, but I think for now, I think this is going to be fine. Um, so this is very useful because now, uh, you know, we can try, I can try ideas um, and just, uh, yeah, I, you know, I don't know. I was looking for a more general solution. Solution, um, For example, I think I have, you know, some quick optimizations. For example, this unpack text. See, this is in, in line assembler. Uh, I mean, I can still use that here. So that's one of the requirements I had. So it still works. So there's no problem with that. So I can use that within line assembler. So I didn't want something to process the complete file. It doesn't make sense. And also because all the subtotals, you probably, you know, when you get conditional, uh, you know, conditionals like this one, uh, it's not that useful. So you just get the block that you want to optimize and then you can iterate over on that. Um, until basically, you know, you get to some somewhere where it's faster, or you decide that the code you have is good enough. Uh, um, so yeah, set a count, set eighty count. Um, I would, as I said, I would put the link in the in the video notes. Although you know, you can go to my GitHub repo and um, sorry, my, yeah, my GitHub account. And there's a repo over there, which is uh, my username is Raydrag, so you can go and find me there. Um, so yeah, I mean at this point, I think I'm not completely sure I'm going to bother to try to improve this further. Um, I think it really depends, but. Yeah, I mean, actually, the vertical, the vertical scroll is quite good. You don't have that much, you know, you don't see that much, the problem, really. It's more the horizontal one. Mm. And obviously, it also depends. I mean, if the, if the player is, the character is in the line that is actually showing the the glitch or you know a character like that one that this one here then well yeah you can notice that more because it's, it's actually in the action that you're playing um but well i don't know how important is that i'm not sure i think probably it's not that important i mean in general the game moves okay yeah i mean it's true that being just basically you know, without the smell area and a lot of scroll. And there is also, as you can see, I mean, it's hard to see, but do you pay attention to the, to the, to the sound effects? Actually, I'm not completely sure you can hear the sound effects. Anyway, uh, if you can't hear the sound effects, I will fix that for the next one. But basically you can tell that when it's scrolling, the steps are, a little bit slower, it moves a little bit faster when there is no scroll, but it's almost the same. So I think that's great. It means that we are almost uh, 16 frames per second. Um, and I think it's very important that the game is smooth, even if it's uh, in a fixed uh, frame rate that is not too high. I mean, 12 is probably too low, but with 16 is very responsive. So I will say that is more than enough. Um, so I'm probably going to continue with the game. Um, I'm not going to work more on performance for now. I mean, I always say that, you know, I, I can always co go back and try to improve things. But the truth is um, when you work, you know, you keep moving forward with the game you may realize that making those changes is too expensive. And um, I mean, 
uh, it's unlikely that I need to rewrite the game, uh, but yeah, I think if I move on with this performance, I think it's going to be stay like that. No, I don't think I'm going to try to improve that any, any further. Anyway, so it's been uh, a non, it's not been really a cold session, but because I had so many things to explain and I try and I wanted to um, kind of uh, show what I was doing in the last two sessions, I didn't record. So I think uh, I'm going to keep it a little bit short today um, and see how it goes. Um, now, what I'm going to work next time, I honestly don't know. Um, night night is finished. Um, I'm basically waiting for release. The testing is finished. There's no, there are no more issues to fix. Uh, the cartridge has been tested. Um, so everything is in place. Um, so there's nothing to do there, uh, which means that I can move to the next project and I'm not sure if that next project is going to be this one or if I should go back to my uh, the second the sequel to um, Golden Tail uh, which is uh, Kitsune's Curse uh, for the Amstrad CPC um, I'm not completely sure or I might even just work on a different platform maybe keep doing a little bit with MSX because um, in this, I mean, the library I'm working here in the Specky uh, is uh, in inspired by um, the stuff I've been doing with the, sorry, the library for the Specky here is inspiring the stuff I've been doing for the um, MSX. So it means that I have a library uh, in Assembler for the MSX that you can use with SDCC and you can make games in C, like uh, Night Night, which is uh, mostly written in C um, and I would like to release that library but that library needs a few things before that happens one of them is writing documentation uh, not a lot uh, but some of it um, I mean we can even take a look to to the header to see um, so that was a uh, night uh, live uh, MSX. Yeah. So this is basically uh, the header, and it's just going through this stuff, which is not a lot. I mean, I mean, this is just some constants for a few bits, but it's not a lot really. Um, it's just documenting this um, because this is kind of low level. Um, so this library is basically a wrapper around the BIOS functions because I'm not using hardware directly. I, I just wanted, I mean, I might change that later, uh, but for now, I think uh, I like the idea of using the BIOS and being compatible with every MSX computer out there without too much trouble. Um, so this is just a wrapper around that, those functions. Um, there's other stuff uh, for the sprite flicker and fee and um, and a sprite pattern manager that is very useful and I'm probably going to include that as a kind of a library that you build on top of this. Um, so I need to write some documentation, but that's not probably not for the <laughs> for a coding session, um, but. What I need to include on besides that documentation is a game. So something that is simple is an example game. Um, because you know, Night Night is not is it's not a complicated game, but it's still not I don't think it's a good example to learn to use this library or to get yourself started programming in C. Um, because it's quite tricky. If you don't if you don't explain things uh, well enough, the only people that can understand why you why you are explaining is probably the people that don't really need to write code in C, I guess, because they couldn't be doing it in, in assembler. Um, so I want to have something that is quite high level um, 
that you can still uh, learn to use the library and, and get yourself uh, up to speed uh, making games for the MSX. So that could be an interesting project I could be doing now. Um, um, something very simple. I don't know, I was thinking about maybe some sort of space invaders, or something like that, uh, which uh, has some, some interesting ideas that you could use mixture of tiles and hardware sprites to make it look nice and smooth. Um, so that could be an interesting project, but I still don't know. I mean, there are other ideas that could, you know, it could be a Sokoban or, you know, any simple game that is not about time. It's not about finishing the game quickly. It's more about being a small game that you can basically um, read the code as a good example of how things work. Even, you know, if it's, there is good documentation, that's always helpful, but sometimes uh, it's easier if you have a working example. Um, and I think that's all, everything I want to say today. Um, I guess we'll have to wait for the next session to know what I'm going to do next. Okay, um, if you like this or not, uh, you can subscribe. Um, I mean, if you like it, it's great. And if you don't, I don't know, maybe you might like the next one. <laughs> Um, or in any case, thank you for watching. Bye now.